We should stipulate that cost is the question, right? Like that is the question that almost everybody with a hand up is gonna ask in some form. Because, maybe not, but it hits everybody so hard. And, and is that where the loon shots come in, in terms of like really, truly trying to reinvent this business model? Because to be honest, like the investors I know, they're not trying to, they're not trying to reinvent the model. They're in it because it's a gold rush. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, my name is Phil Rado. I'm the general manager for WGBH News and for WGBH Radio and for a lot of the local things that we do on both radio and television. And it is uh, a pleasure to welcome you here to WGBH. Should be a very interesting night tonight. So a geneticist walks into a bar. I probably shouldn't do this. So a geneticist walks into the bar and orders 10 shots of vodka. Wow, says the bartender. That's an order of magnitude. Is this supposed to be sort of a science crowd? No? All right. All right. How many of you have visited us before at some? Wow, OK. So uh, I really get a kick out of being able to say hi and thank you to people in person. Broadcasters tend to work in closed spaces. We're not really sure if there's anybody out there. And so when we see you, we know you're here. Public media, I think particularly, uh, we like to say is sort of the last locally owned and operated media in the United States. And I think that creates a very different bond with the communities that we serve. So it's especially nice to see you out here uh, this evening. And what a beautiful day in Boston it was. So this is going to be a thought-provoking evening. I mean, we're talking about genetics, we're talking about privacy, we're talking about health. And one other thing uh, to note about tonight's uh, event is that we have two hosts who are on uh, programs that are syndicated by two different networks. And uh, Marketplace is clearly from American Public Media and Innovation Hub is a owned and operated WGBH PRI PRX. And between those two and NPR, that is about 99% of everything that you hear on public radio across the country. And they do compete, but it is nice in the spirit of what we do on our own schedules. This is to the benefit of the listener. And tonight, both of those networks are represented on our stage and in person. So um, I think that's pretty cool as well. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, this was a really popular event. And so uh, I also want to say hi to the people who are streaming this on Facebook. We're going to take questions in here at the end. So sort of be thinking about your questions throughout the discussion. Um, and we'll also take some Facebook uh, questions. And um, I'm thrilled to have Molly here. Even though we're frenemies, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> We're we weren't. Get along fine. <laughs> we weren't until <laughs> Phil brought that up. But um, no. Um, and you've had the perfect Boston day. You were telling me. I've had the perfect Boston day, you guys. Thank you for bringing me here. <laughs> Don't tell anybody at work. Oh wait, we're streaming on. Uh, yeah. On Facebook. Yeah. Darn it. But it includes a lobster roll, which I think is it includes a pretty lobster roll. key. You can't have the. I ran along the Charles River. So you know. The cherry blossom. Really, Boston <laughs> has really put on a show for me. So I'm going to be back frequently. Um, so anyway, we're thrilled to have you here. And before we dive into our main topic, which is about biotech, I thought we'd just take a few minutes to kind of talk ourselves. Um, I listen to Molly every day on the radio. You probably do too. Um, and I'm just going to start by asking you, um, what got you away from you know, print and the New York Times to um, doing Marketplace. I feel terrible about this because my bio was like already an hour long. I really have to edit that thing. Um, and I want to get to know you a little bit too because Kara's obviously had a fantastic career. Marketplace, you know, Marketplace had a great story to tell, which is we would like you to come here and be as smart as you can possibly be. Um, and it's just, it's such a good show and it's such a good brand. And it just was a, a fantastic opportunity to sort of you know, I had done a lot of really consumer-oriented tech coverage for a long time. I've been covering the tech industry in some form or another for 20 years. And I am, you know, like a secret policy wonk and had really watched these businesses evolve 
the funding evolve and was just really ready to make that turn toward business. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so h how has your life changed? Like, how has getting into radio changed your life? Like, I I'd be interested in knowing too, I mean, we hear the final product, but if you work in radio, you know that that is so different from the initial product, like where you start. Yep. So when you produce something, um, a segment what is like four and a half minutes. Four minutes. minutes. Four yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, what goes into doing that? You know, so before I came to Marketplace, the only I had done podcasting. That was sort of my only, you know, audio. I had contributed to Marketplace Tech, and I had done every other form of journalism. And I really thought that radio would be a lot like video. You've done TV and video, yeah. and so you, you probably know where I'm going with this. And it's really not. Like I thought, well, you just, you get some extra sound and some B-roll and you talk to someone and they're interesting, that's fine. I thought it was just like a person and a microphone and there was just nothing else. Yeah. And I was like, how hard could this be? How hard could this be? You should see the size of the rig that they put in my basement. <laughs> that alone, I have a whole dedicated internet just for, for that. Um, but what I realized is that radio, and, one of, and this is one of the things that I think makes it great when it's great, it's so precise. You can't, you have to get the person on the other end of the phone to say exactly what you need them to say, to say it well. You can't cover it with pretty pictures like you can in video if they don't say it quite right. And, and then they have to, not only do they have to be smart and informed on their topic, they have to sound good yeah. and be able to articulate things well. And, it's, it's been so much more challenging and so much more interesting than I ever would have expected to just put radio together. So if you have a four minute final product, yeah. which is some of it's you talking and other things, I assume the interview with the person, like the final cut down interview is like three, two and a half or something. 2.15, yeah. 2.15, how long did you talk to that person for to get two minutes? So much longer than that. <laughs> My producers hate me. <laughs> My problem is that I'm interested in everything. Um, it, it took me a while to learn this actually. And when I first started, so I also back up Kai Rizdahl on the evening right. program Marketplace. And they're much more, they're much better about what we call taping to time with the guest, really? yeah. And I think just because that show goes on live and you're often taping same day and it's just a whole different, and it, I have pushed the boundaries now that I've been doing it long enough because I, I just, I want to know more. We'll get like eight minutes of tape for our 215. That's pretty good. I thought you were going to say 30 minutes of tape. I mean, that's happened. I, I remember going I remember going to visit um, Steve Inskeep at Morning Edition one time, and the book editor, who I think mostly edited stuff from Name Montaigne did, but she was like, oh, yeah, sometimes she'll talk for like an hour, and then and I have to get it to six minutes. And I'm like, that's such a hard job. Oh, that's so much better. Good. <laughs> I would say, you know, like 15 is pretty standard. Okay. Eight is when I'm being really disciplined, and okay. 30 is when I have like a sci-fi author on the phone. <laughs> Got and it. then we're Got just, it. we're not stopping. So um, finally, I'm interested in topics. What are you interested in covering? Mm -hmm. How do you think your interests have changed over the time in terms of like what you want to put on the radio? Yeah, you know, you know that tech and innovation are huge buckets and you could easily get distracted or, or weirdly end up doing the same stories over and over again, which I think, I think we can all agree that tech press is a little bit guilty of. And so for me, the, the filter of business and technology is incredibly helpful because, in fact, when I took over the Marketplace Tech Show about a year and a half ago, we launched, we relaunched the show with a whole series of shows on venture capital hmm. and how venture capital works and where that money comes from and how did you know your pension fund is invested in venture capital firms who then invest in, you know, in some percentage of risky investments. And, um, and it, so it's been great to sort of look at the tech universe with that lens and then have that coincide with this moment where everybody's realizing just how much money and power is at stake. Yeah. And, and frankly, when everybody's thinking, I sort of thought that I understood how Facebook made money, but maybe I really don't. And so for me, it's sort of useful to be able to, to filter by saying, how does this company make money? And what does that uncover? Did you know famously that's like the question that led to the Enron undoing? A reporter from Fortune asked the Enron CEO during an earnings call, how do you make money? And what do you say? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know? There was a long pause while we went really to check pause, their and annual the answer report. made no sense. And that, that is the question that led to the great unraveling of Enron. Whoa. Yeah. 
So I feel like there's a lot of power in that all by itself as a filter. Asking the basic mm -hmm. question. And it's interesting when we get into biotech this evening, the, I think people think like there's tech, there's biotech, but like increasingly they sort of want a piece of each other maybe and oh, it's absolutely. like, you know. So. Well, and this goes back to the investment piece in, and in particular and why we find biotech so interesting over in Silicon Valley is because it's become, well, also everyone's obsessed with Theranos right now because of the documentary, and, but also because it revealed a lot about venture capital. Mm -hmm. It revealed a lot about investment. It revealed a lot about biotech as what some parts of the investment community consider a gold rush. And what that is going to mean when our health is at stake. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's been a really, uh, a really profoundly interesting story. It's been really fascinating to talk to investors and private equity in Boston and have them say, we actually ask for peer reviewed science before we invest, which it's possible some of their compatriots in Silicon Valley do not do mm -hmm. um, because they are accustomed to dealing with a PowerPoint and a dream. And it's just a really, really different culture. And so watching those two things collide and watching you know, people like Mark Andreessen, uh, who is now obviously a famous venture capitalist, invented the Netscape browser, say, get all excited about how the human body is the next great hacking platform. <laughs> like, we have questions. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we're gonna ask some. And of we're them. gonna ask some of them. Yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. really, yeah, I'm really yeah. excited about this. Panel. Okay, can we talk about you now? Sure. I feel uncomfortable <laughs> talking about me. <laughs> How did you come from academia to journalism? So I'll give you the like the short version of the story. Um, I've always been interested in like um, pol politics has been a huge interest of mine and ideas and culture and stuff. And so as I was going through graduate school with just the goal of being a professor of English. Um, I was like kind of moonlighting doing um, media stuff, you know, like I wrote columns and then during the 2008 campaign I did a lot of analysis on television um, and I started doing some analysis on television at WGBH um, and actually this the radio station 89.7, which probably a lot of people have listened to, was mostly like classical music then. But they changed the format while I was doing some of this TV stuff. And so I, I was like, oh yeah, I wanna sub for, I wanna see if I can like sub for you know, a radio host and see what that's like. And I just, you know, I loved it because you get to have in-depth conversations. Um, no one puts makeup on you that you can never take off because it's so thick you that's just really can't. Um, like I know, it's really nice. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, I don't know if like, Phil's around, but I um, pitched Phil, yeah, in uh, like 2011. And I was like, so I'd like to host a radio show. And, um, you know, we, we put something together quickly. And it was like this local show, 7 a.m. Saturday morning. And um, eventually, after a while, I realized I w was working two full-time jobs, which you can only do for so long. And, um, and then I quit that job to do this job. So that's how that happened. All right, and so not politics necessarily, though. No. How did you decide on innovation, and how do you keep that topic in line? How do you wrangle that? I wish I could say it was like the most brilliant thought out discussion, and we really like, you know, thought out all the options, but really, we wanted to do something about innovation. We knew Boston was an innovative town, and so we were like, yeah, we'll just do innovation. And in, in fact, in the beginning, it was a much more techy show. Yeah. Um, and over time, I just followed my interest, which is sometimes tech, but sometimes it's like, you know, we've done segments on like how H.J. Hines basically invented the packaged foods industry and how that changed everything. And how, you know, Estee Lauder, not just, invented a company, but, but really changed the makeup industry. We've done things on electric guitars, like all over the place, and biotech. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so in some ways, it's, you know how you were saying, like, it's good to, you know, sort of filter things in a certain way, and you have certain kinds of things. I think having the filter of innovation has been really helpful, because it's, it can be in any area, but the person or the thing that we're talking about has to have sort of changed our culture, changed our world in some way, yeah. so, yeah. Which feels like a really nice way for us to segue into what yes. we're talking about tonight, yeah. because yeah. obviously this feels, Mark Andreessen's uh, bluster notwithstanding, 
it does feel like we're on the precipice, and I, I'm interested to see what our panelists have yeah. to say about this, but on the precipice of, of some pretty dramatic change around our health and our bodies. Yep, and, and one of the reasons we chose this topic is because just about 20 years ago in the East Room of the White House, um, President Bill Clinton um, on satellite with uh, uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair um, in London, he talked about how we had finished sequencing the human genome. Uh, it was June of 2000, and I think people thought like, okay, now everything's gonna be different. And I was talking to Molly on the phone, and I was like, it's a little bit like what happened in 2000, I feel like, with the dot-com boom. It wasn't that the internet was, was over, like, you know, that internet thing, that's done now. Um, but it was more that, you know, it, it took a lot longer to get to the big changes you know, and then I think people thought it was going to. I think people thought like the next day everything was going to change. Mm -hmm. And I think, in fact, almost 20 years later, we really are at this moment. So I'm going to invite up Katrine Bosley and Ute Myers to start us off. Um, and uh, we're going to start off by talking, uh, we're, we have two panels tonight right. and then everybody will come up for questions. Yeah, you guys can, I think yeah. they can go there, yeah. You could just, we're, we're, we're changing it. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. We have a map. Liz, you're amazing. We messed it up. I know. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Katrine has been part of the biotech world for nearly 30 years. Um, most recently, she was the CEO of Editas Medicine, which has been pioneering um, the advancement of gene editing medicines based on CRISPR. And Ute Myers has a PhD in molecular biology, and he's the chief financial officer at Pure Tech Health, which invests in biotech companies and also helps create them. Thanks so much to both of you for being Thanks here. For having me. Thank Pleasure. you. I feel like let's let's do some baseline setting here before we jump into our conversation. Does everybody here feel like they have an idea of what CRISPR is? No. <laughs> okay, hold on. If I'm yes, glad you're all on the same page. If yes, I know, or there was like all of this <laughs> happening. If you do, raise your hands. Okay, if you don't, raise your hands. Okay, so definitely worth explaining that. And then, I'm gonna do this for my sake, but also yours. Do you feel like you know what we mean when we say biotech? Yes, yeses go up. Okay, everybody's got that one. All right. Katrine, tell us what CRISPR is. Well, the, the formal, Definition is clustered regularly into space short palindromic repeats, which is incredibly <laughs> unhelpful. Uh, but there's actually a very, you talk about powerful questions, there's a very powerful question that I often ask to help people imagine what it's all about, which is, what if you could repair broken genes? If you think about diseases that are caused by mistakes in DNA, there's six, 7,000 of them, and some are more familiar, like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease. There's, there's a whole range of them. And they're caused by a mistake in the DNA code, and the consequences are often a very serious disease. What if you could go in and fix that mutation, fix that broken gene? So that idea has been around for a long time, and actually, CRISPR, while that's the, the gene editing technology that's really captured everybody's imagination, it's not the first gene editing technology. There are earlier technologies that began to pave the way, you know, as long as 20 years ago, zinc finger nucleases and talons and all these things. But what they have in common is that you build a molecule that very specifically recognizes a specific place in the genome out of the three billion base pairs or letters of the genome, recognizes the place where a mutation occurs, and then you can essentially edit or correct that mutation. So the goal is then to use this technology, which works brilliantly in the laboratory. It's revolutionizing basic biological research. But how do you make medicines out of it? And that's what Editas and, and other companies in the field have been working to do, is to take it and translate that into something that actually helps people with these serious genetic disorders. So you, I talked about this kind of it's almost 20 years now, right, since President Clinton was like, this amazing thing has happened. He called it a wondrous map um, that we had come up with. And I wonder, I mean, you've, you've been watching this, this sort of industry evolve. Where are, what have we, what do we know now that we didn't know 20 years ago? Where have we come? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Minute, so, uh, <laughs> look, 20 years ago, it's interesting because I finished my PhD in 2000, so it's about 20 years ago. 
Um, and at the time, uh, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, right? Sequencing a genome. So a genome is about 3 billion A, G, C's and T's, 3 billion. When I was doing my graduate work, it would take about a couple of days to do 300. And if you were lucky, you would get to 300. And otherwise, your little glass plate would break and your gel would drop and you have to go back and you just wasted two days. So I would argue that that was a major breakthrough. There's many ways in which I can address your question, but let me just give a couple of examples. Human genome sequencing means that we can read DNA. We didn't stop there. What we started to do then is use that to identify in a very precise way, which had never been able, we had never been able to do before. What are these mutations that cause disease? And we started to identify SNPs. SNPs is a single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and then from there, we started looking at, so how are these things connected? And we didn't stop there, because we didn't only read the DNA, we started writing with that DNA. Amazing, some of the technologies that were developed. I've been, and I'll choose my words carefully, because I understand you make people say exactly what you want them to say, and you have a specialty in venture capital, so I'll be, <laughs> I plead guilty. After my PhD, I went to the investment side, that's where I've been for about 19 years, so I'll choose my words carefully. But, um, I've been privileged to have invested and seen some of these things come through. If you go back, if you ask me what has the impact of sequencing a genome been, let me try to make it very tangible. Because of that, I would argue we can now empower our immune system in a very precise, amazing way to cure some diseases, cure some diseases that before let's say five, six, seven, eight years ago, take advanced melanoma, we're a death sentence pretty much for most patients. And now, we, it's not perfect, but we can cure quite a few of these patients. We can very precisely, and, and I think um, Editas is a great example of that, very precisely manipulate this genome, not because we like doing that in the lab, no, because we're creating new medicine. And we have some very pr precise precision medicine approaches that really make an impact these days. It's often said that biotech is a sector of the future. I would agree with that and I would disagree with that. I disagree because it's already now. In the past five to ten years we've seen an amazing wave of breakthrough technologies coming through, very different modalities. It used to be simple, small molecules and then proteins, antibodies, vaccines. And now we have cells, we have viruses, we have, you name it, so many new modalities. I would argue, and it takes too much to go back as to why I think that, but having sequenced the human genome was an integral booster in all of that. You, sorry, you mentioned melanoma. Are there other things that you would add to that list of, oh, yeah. what, are, what are a few things that you would say, because of these advances, like this is what we've been seeing Okay, so I'll, I'll take one where I was lucky enough to be an investor. This is a... This is a therapy where you take, you go in and you, these are kids with um, a fortunately rare but deadly sort of uh, blood cancer. And um, what you do is you isolate, isolate a part, a key part of their immune system, the T lymphocyte, it's your kind of your soldier in your immune system, it's the one that goes after a lot. And you take it out of the body, you teach it to recognize the tumor and you put it back. Now, I just said that in like 10 seconds, but to, for us to understand what it takes to do exactly that, manipulate it precisely and then put it back, that would not have been possible in my opinion without uh, understanding of a genome. Um, that treatment has revolutionized, this is called ALL, um, the blood tumor, where you see kids who had gone through every available treatment and failing on it, and with this treatment, you get what's called response rates. Cancer is difficult. You look at response rates, which is tumor shrinkage, and then in the end, you look at overall survival. But the response rates have been amazing. Amazing. And so, this is one. I mean, I mean yeah, if you look, I'm you sure you know more. Broadly, more. Yeah. Uh, there are rare forms of blindness. Um, sickle cell disease is an area where there's been tremendous progress, which is a disease that has had so little innovation and there's such profound need, many forms of cancer, but this is now expanding into many, many other types of, of diseases, uh, types of liver disease, et cetera. And so I think as these technologies have become more robust, you're, it's, it's spreading like wildfire in a great way. And it, you still need expertise in this type of tissue or this biology or this disease, 
but because the underlying foundation of the technology has, has been invested in, I often I think of the Human Genome Project as it's like intellectual infrastructure. You know, back in the 50s, we built the internet in, uh, interstate highway system. Well, in the 90s, we built the intellectual infrastructure of the genome, and it's, it's spreading across many different diseases now. We'll be continuing to advance and build that knowledge base, as, as uh, you've said, it's, we've added to it since, 19, uh, since 2000. But, uh, but we're actually really able to put it to work in broad-based ways now. Well, and there's also an argument that, uh, that we might over-rotate on cures a little bit, that there is this sort of branch of predictive science rather than drugs that can go into that. Can you speak to that at all? The idea that by understanding yeah. what might go wrong. One of the, well, one of the things I think that is, is often a misperception about having the human genome sequenced is it tells us all the answers. As powerful as DNA sequence is, not all of biology happens at the level of DNA. You know, DNA turns into RNA, turns into proteins, and then that goes back and modifies. There's a sort of a cycle of DNA, RNA, protein. And biology happens at all those different levels. And some diseases are clearly driven by a genetic mutation, a genetic mistake. Others, it's a contributor, but it's not definitive. Right? It, it may increase your risk or reduce your risk. And I think this is what you're talking about. And frankly, you know, many people in this room, in fact, may have, have for fun, had themselves sequenced with 23andMe or, or uh, Ancestry.com or, or some other uh, sequencing for fun. But you know, what does it tell you about your health? Well, a lot of what your genome tells you about your health is you may have a higher risk or a lower risk. But it doesn't necessarily tell you what to do. And a lot of the genome is like that. And so I think the question of what does one do with genetic information, if you just have it on your own, or if you are learning in collaboration with a physician, or you know, there's a lot of circumstances where people are now getting information about their DNA, and how does it connect to knowledge about health? There's often a fairly big gap there, either because maybe that person doesn't know, or maybe because we don't know. We still have a lot to learn to connect genetic information and true knowledge about health and a lot of the sequencing initiatives that, that are occur in academia right now, I think, are really important contributors to this, where sequencing you know, a million people, a million genomes, but it's not just about the sequence. It's also adding information about that person's actual life and health, doing it in a way that is very controlled with regard to privacy and data usage, which I think is a huge issue in this area. And so I think there's, there's a lot of these sorts of issues that are, we're, we're just beginning to touch uh, because it, frankly, is affecting everybody. I mean, a lot of people have been sequenced at this point. Let me follow up on that issue of data. Raise your hand if you have, like, done 23andMe or Ancestry or for some other reason had your genome sequenced or like, at least part of it. They don't do everything, but okay. Well, maybe like a many. quarter. Yeah, maybe a quarter. Yeah. Um, you, I wonder, I mean, and then you've got like countries like Iceland and then, um, Britain has a big initiative of sequencing genomes. So you've got whole places where this is like a very big, you know, something that people are um, really encouraged to do. Um, and I, I think um, 23andMe made a deal with GlaxoSmithKline for, to try to work on drug development. What does it mean that, you know, back in 2000, almost nobody's genome had been sequenced, but now we just have, one. 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 Right. So we now we have, one. right. So now we have millions and millions. I think 23 yeah. million has done like 8 million or something. But like, what does that mean that now we have these huge data sets that people can kind of go searching around in? Well, I may give you a little bit of a funny answer, but I think today not that much yet. Really? Don't underestimate ever the complexity of disease in the human body. I've had if you're a portfolio manager, you're in a privileged position where you get to speak to some of the most brilliant minds in medicine and academia. And the smartest people will tell you what they don't know. And there's so much we don't know yet. So it is a great thing, for example, to study in Britain. It's longitudinal. So they, they take large patient subsets and they follow them over time. And they start to put things together. Like if you start off with this genotype, and maybe at some point even they're able to track certain mutations, what does that mean? And can you start seeing parallels. You can imagine you need very large populations to start seeing those things. And then you apply artificial intelligence. Let me talk about that. Artificial intelligence can be very powerful. It can do things that the human mind cannot conceive. 
it can also create a lot of smoke and mirrors and, and, and noise because um, some of the conversations I have had with very good tech investors have been great and some of them have been just a waste of time because the moment you think that like and I don't want to single anything out here but that the human body is a like hackable frontier give me a break um, <laughs> there, there are so many things that honestly that you have to be humble of in the front in, in the face of biology and medicine that we don't understand so my answer would be today maybe we don't we don't use it that much yet but this is building and it's extending over time and more and more people get into studies like this and we start seeing patterns and AI is very good at detecting these patterns so what that means for me is that hopefully all of that means we can be more precise in you know if we say you know take a disease like rheumatoid arthritis or any sort of CNS disorder that is not one disease that is a subs that is a, a collection of a whole bunch of different diseases and if we can use large data and longitudinal studies to precisely identify certain patients that may benefit. I mean, this is great. And I think that's the future and we'll get there, but, but it takes time and a lot of data. And, and so I'm glad we're doing it. I'm not even talking about 23 and me. I think there's some plus and minuses there, but the longer longitudinal studies for sure mm -hmm. will, will show value. Maybe one of the best examples today is cancer. We used to define cancer by what organ in the body it showed up. It's breast cancer, it's pancreatic cancer. You know, we call it breast cancer because we detect it in the breast, or pancreatic because we detect it in the pancreas. But as we've gotten more sophisticated understanding, you know, what, what's going wrong with those tumor cells are your own body's cells that have grown out of control. And understanding the genetics of cancer has caused a redefinition of, you know, maybe you don't really have you know, breast cancer. It's, you know, describe the mutation of your gene cancer. And maybe that same mutation causes a cancer someplace else in the body. And so there's, there's, there's sort of a, a, you know, we still tend to detect it by body system, but there is this understanding of understanding the genetic signature of your cancer can point you in one treatment direction versus another. Another area, so it, at, Editas, at Editas, one of the diseases we work on is a form of, can, uh, sorry, a form of blindness caused by a genetic disease. There's this group of, blindness disease is called inherited retinal dystrophy. So inherited, you inherit it, retinal, it affects the cells of the retina, dystrophy, they, they tend, you go blind and there's, there's a number of different patterns and they're all one big group. They're not one big group, they're completely different diseases and we now can connect this genetic mutation leads to this version and this one to this other disease and they kind of show up the same in the clinic but the way you're gonna treat them if you wanna fix the broken gene there's like zero overlap between the treatment for those two patients. It's a different gene, it's in a different part of the genome, it's in different cells in the retina, and it's fascinating to kind of reconceptualize disease by genetic signatures as opposed to by a, what we call phenotypic or just the phenomenology and where it shows up and what the symptoms are. So part of what we need to do as well is how do we help physicians and in, in, in medical schools redefine disease because that's part of the journey of this. It's not just the technology, it's those that are really at the front line of treating patients rethinking what the definition of disease is. So not to sound too Silicon Valley here, but I think about scale a lot and how some of these things will be able to scale and to what extent they are, if at all, a part of your routine medical care. Mm. And so I wonder, you know, what is it gonna take in terms of education, in terms of investment, in terms of, uh, I, don't, I don't know, targeting different diseases, you know, at what, point, at what point does it hit me if I don't have a rare disease? At Pure Tech, yeah. we have a lot of things that we focus on, on, on chronic diseases, so very large indications, right? And I think um, your question is spot on, because, um, so our, our conviction is that if you bring forward innovative products, um, you cannot say that they're targeted for the entire population. You're going to have to be more precise than that. Also, if as a society we're willing to pay for some of these treatments, you cannot pay for things that don't work in a large part of the population, right? So this precision medicine, call, it's a word that's been overused in my opinion, but the core of it is very true. Um, the more precise you can be, the more benefit you have in a certain population, the better. And also therein lies part of scaling, because I think, in my opinion, particularly at this day and age, and, and 
lived in Europe, you can tell by my funny accent, I'm not American, I'm Dutch. And then, um, I mean, the way things are going in many European countries in terms of payer involvement <coughs> and willingness to pay, times where you can come with a drug that doesn't work across the population only for a subset, and then on top of that is a slight iteration, maybe slightly better than what's out there, that's gone. So, in my opinion at least. So, um, your point is very well taken. I would agree with that. The, the, the precision part is essential. Yeah. I, I just have a final question. It's a little bit of a variation on that. If it's a waste of money to give people you know, or to give a whole population a drug when like it's only going to lower some people's cholesterol and if we knew more about their genetics we would know this is not going to work for this person. I wonder about, so th and that's the, like the saving money part of understanding genetics, but the, you know, you were talking about rare forms of blindness or, you know, we've seen um, cures for hepatitis C and some of these things are amazing, but, and I also have this question for the next panel, but this anticipates is just like, how do you, in a system that is built to like provide Molly healthcare every year, and you know, she might go to a different employer and then that person will deal with her next year, you know, how, how do you deal with a situation where somebody has a, a, a problem and it's gonna cost $100,000 or a million dollars, which is not unheard of, to fix the problem? Now in the long run, they might not go through $3 million of treatment over the next 40 years. But the insurance company doesn't care about the long run. They're here for like this fiscal year. But I think this is where, uh, first and foremost, what will force the question is actual therapies. A theoretical question, a theoretical possibility doesn't force this question. Now that these therapies are emerging, those discussions are happening. And I think that, that's what really leads the way is, it, actually, this is tangible, this is real, it's not theoretical. I think the other thing is that the voice of the patient in that becomes essential. Because if we do need to change mechanics of, of how drugs are paid for, because you know, we don't ask this question for surgeries, because surgery is paid for differently than drugs are paid for. So it happens to come up with drugs, and these are drugs that are these sorts of, of durable therapies. Um, having that multi-stakeholder conversation is essential, because our system isn't designed to pay for these right now. It tends to have a, a simpler conversation in single-payer systems because the interests are more aligned, but those systems don't reward innovation as well. So it's, it's not so much a one is better or worse. They, they raise very different issues. Um, but I think what really will drive the question here is the actual therapy where you can actually benefit somebody, you have a very different conversation than when it's theoretical. Um, that is a perfect, so we're going to, so what we're doing here is, uh, this is our conversation about the promise. We're going to bring up and have a little bit of a conversation about the drawbacks with our next two panelists, and then everyone's going to come back on stage, and we'll chat a little more and take your questions, so I'm going to excuse you for the moment. And then we're going to bring up Safi Bacall, best-selling author of Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. You can and hear him on Innovation Hub. That's Safi, yes. He's been everywhere lately. Uh, and, and in other bona fides, he also co-founded a biotechnology company that developed new drugs for cancer. And then at the end here, we have Barry Wirth, who is an award-winning journalist, the acclaimed author of six books. His most recent is The Antidote, a close-up look at the upstart uh, pharmaceutical company Vertex, located here in Boston, and the world of what you call New Pharma. <coughs> Welcome to the stage, guys. Thanks, so we just discovered we're supposed to be the downers. Yeah. <laughs> These were the two uppers, exciting yes. future innovation. Here's two guys who are going to bring you down. Thanks. We, what a great intro. We oh. tricked you. <laughs> okay. You can throw in some positives if you see them here All and right, there. Yeah. We'll try. yeah. Well, I mean, let's start with you, Barry. I mean, you have literally been immersed in this company for years. Tell us a little bit about this case study and what it tells you about some of the things that you just heard. I've written two books about Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Uh, the first one came out in 1994. I was a magazine writer at the time, and I was looking for an opportunity to get inside a laboratory so that I could follow scientists and see how they did their work. And, um, and I, I got inside Vertex when there were uh, five scientists. They had one small garage in Cambridgeport. Uh, they, uh, the day I arrived, there were jackhammers digging up the floor. They were laying pipe for the land. So I'd been there from the beginning, 
And the first book told the story of how they got off the ground. Um, then I went away and wrote a bunch of other books and then came back in 2011 to follow them as they launched their first and second drug. Their first drug was the first direct, anti direct acting antiviral drug to treat hepatitis C, really the first um, widespread cure. And uh, the second drug was for cystic fibrosis. Vertex, if you know the company, is now known primarily, if not exclusively, as a company that is in the process of turning cystic fibrosis from a invariably fatal disease, a horrible disease, um, affecting primarily the lungs, but also the digestive tract and many other tissues in the bottom in the body, to a um, a disease that you can live with and have an entirely full life. Uh, it's a huge transformation, and it's become kind of the model for um, treating genetic diseases and looking at how um, these um, discoveries uh, since the 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 solution of the human genome can be expanded into treating specifically inherited diseases. There are 70,000 people around the world who have cystic fibrosis. About half of them are in this country. And Vertex, in 20 years, has now gotten to the point where they're about to be able to treat probably two-thirds of those people. So it's been extraordinary. On the other hand, the drugs cost $300,000 per patient per year. It's a very high price tag. Um, there, we can talk about why they should cost that much, but the fact is they do. And, um, and the, the key for the company, which I, which I think deserves a lot of credit for this, has been to try to separate cost and access. Yes, that's the cost. And in the United States, at least, everybody who qualifies for the drug gets it. So the company uses some of that money that they get from charging that much to give drug for free to people who can't afford it. This has become a much more delicate issue in Europe, which doesn't, um, it doesn't have a market like ours. What's, what's, what's important to understand about drugs is that selling drugs is different from selling anything else, because the user and the customer and the payer are three different entities. So the user may desire the drug. The customer, being the doctor who has to prescribe the drug, may have a different position on that. And then, of course, the payer may yet have a, a different position as well. But what, just to sum up briefly, within the last few weeks, the CEO of Vertex, um, Jeff Lydon, flew and had to testify before Parliament because Vertex and the British National Health Service and the um, the, the, the formulary, which is called NICE, have been at loggerheads for three years about how to pay for this. Vertex is willing to, as all drug companies are, to discount their drugs in countries that don't have a kind of whatever the market will bear sensibility as we have here. But um, Britain has said to them, we can't pay this price at all. We'll give you $500 million a year for all of the drug that we need. We'll give you um, $500 million over five years, a $1 billion over 10 years. They're so far apart that it, uh, it's, it's gotten to be a very contentious issue in, Brook, in, in, in Britain. There are people who are complaining that, that, that their people are not getting access to the drug, and that, in fact, people may have died because the company refused to um, negotiate a price. So we have this wondrous opportunity now with these drugs to cure diseases that were incurable before, but the price is exceedingly high, and that's something that's just going to have to get worked out. So Safi, let me follow up on that. Um, and this, it also kind of builds on what Katrine was talking about. I mean, you used to run a biotech company. Uh, you probably, you can set me straight if I'm wrong, but you probably think that a lot of money goes into developing drugs. If if we're in this situation where the more we know about genetics tells us that a lot of drugs are really much more um, sort of subsets than we thought, and it's, there's not like this one big overarching pill we can give to everybody and everybody's cholesterol will be lowered, everybody will be cured of cancer, whatever. Talk about this collision course that we're on where things are very expensive, we don't really have a system set up for it, like, okay, so what's, what do you see coming then? Well, I would say two things. One is, what often gets lost in the noise of pricing is that those high prices are for 10 years. After that, it's effectively free. 
it goes generic. So I'll give you an example. The statins, when they were discovered, which was well before Just the to lower cholesterol, to lower cholesterol, the Lipitor, the Crestor, the Zocor, when they were discovered in the 80s, well before the genomics, they were reasonably high priced. Now you can get them for pennies or almost free. And those were one of the great medical breakthroughs. So, okay, what was reasonably high priced well, compared to $300,000 per person per year? Right, but when you multiply 20 million times a small amount, it ends up, the total cost to the taxpayer ends up being, you know, large with the statins, and that was true, but you can also get statins at a pharmacy. Some pharmacies just give them away as like a freebie with other products now. So one thing to keep in mind is that drugs like Vertex's drug, once they go generic, all of a sudden it's available to society. And that was the original design of the patent system to encourage innovation. The second thing is I am actually, I'm an optimist and I do think that we are at an extremely interesting and unusual time and an inflection point. And I I have been one of the doubters and skeptics of the Silicon Valley, the Mark Andreasens, who say, well, all this fancy gizmo stuff is going to change everything. And probably like most of my colleagues here in Boston who did drug discovery, we just sort of roll our eyes and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, stuff that works in a laboratory dish, it's so far from a laboratory dish to a real drug that works. It's like having an idea in a shower and then having a finished movie. It's years and years and years. <laughs> and the steps between an idea in a shower and the Transformers or the Avengers is just, you know, it's so hard to describe. The people who have done that, it's years and years and hundreds of turns. I think we're at the beginning of something very different, and that is a change in the incentive system that's driven in some sense by wearables and by data. And here's what I mean by that. For 200 years, we've more or less been discovering drugs the same way. We throw some stuff at some proteins or some cells at a dish, try to see if it makes some changes that we think are good, then give it to patients and hope it works. With genomics, it sort of helped make a little bit of that more, you know, a little bit more scientific, which sort of helped, not as much as people thought it would, but it's starting to turn around. But it's basically the same thing we've been doing for 200 years. What's going to change in the next five or 10 years, wearables is going to give physicians, payers, customers access to not one order of magnitude, but many, many, many orders of magnitude more data about a patient. So today, I might see my doctor or physician 10 minutes in a year. I don't know how often you guys see. It, sometimes you skip years if you're a little busy. Um, now, with some of these wearables, they're not quite there yet. They're still at the toy novelty level, but they are growing so fast. There are a few clinical grade ones, measure glucose, measure heart. You can start to pick up heart problems that you could never have imagined, but wearing it 24 hours continuous. So now, your physician, even more importantly, your payer, is going to get real incredible amounts of deep data on you that they never had access before. And we may shift into a system that's totally different. Before, we rewarded companies who developed drugs that solve disease problems. With that kind of data, it's payers who want to make people healthy. They will invest in, oh, I think you know, Molly or Kara, I'm detecting a slight change in her skin conductance that could integrate this disease. Maybe a dietary change could do something. And they're motivated, they're incentivized to do it, to keep you healthy. That's a totally different business model for an industry than let's pay you if you made a drug when someone's near death to try to keep them alive a little bit longer. So I think if you just look at the pace of change of let's see, these wearables and the data, it's not there yet, but in five years maybe, in 10 years almost certainly, it will transform the incentives, which will then transform the behaviors, which can then start saying, we're going to pay you to be healthy, which is a totally different industry. So it's an incredibly exciting time. So that's why I'm an optimist. Me too. I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Let's have some of this conversation about data that, and in a way that I think will mix it up with this sort of inevitable 
conversation about inequality, right? Whenever there's the, you know, the uneven distribution of technology is the kind of story of our age. What happens if you can't not just afford the drug, but can't afford the wearable? What happens if you want to opt out of the data collection? Do you have to be sicker? Um, you know, what, what do those things start to look like? And then we can get to privacy, which is another roughly 90 minutes minimum. <laughs> well, the nice thing is that, you know, a, a drug might cost a few hundred thousand dollars, which is driven really by the high cost of clinical trials and the success. We talked about that once in the past. It's, we're victims of our own success as people live longer and longer. It gets harder and harder to find a good drug, so they get more and more expensive. Wearables can cost, there are you know, clinical grade wearables now for a couple hundred dollars. And it, let's say you can't afford it, but your payer wants to keep you healthy. They don't want to pay your hospital costs. So they will pay you to wear a wearable. It'll be like a car discount. If you, t if you take a wearable, we will pay you because we can prevent you from getting sick and therefore we can prevent you from being hospitalized, which as a payer is the biggest cost. The biggest cost in the healthcare system is hospitalization, not drugs. So let me follow up on that. When everybody has wearables um, and not only your doctor knows more about you, but your healthcare company knows more about you. And even, even in the ether now, and has been for years, of course, this issue of pre-existing conditions. Well, right now we think of pre-existing conditions as like, oh, I had this ailment in the past, and it's on my, medic on my, it's on my chart. Well, just wait until they know what's in my genes and the ex condition I may have in 10 years, right? And that somebody's gonna have to pay for. Um, I just wonder, if you worry about the issue of privacy and what people know about you and, um, and you know, how that sort of changes the game. Barry, you want to start? Um, I think this is more up your alley than mine, so why don't you take it? Well, fortunately, privacy never comes up in the news at all today. Just not a big topic. Also, companies are awesome at protecting your data and once they get it. We can totally, they are so good at that. We can yeah. totally we can trust big companies. Yeah, definitely. Especially if they begin with the letter F. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> moving right along. Uh, no, I think, Ray, I think we're just beginning to see that. I think that, that whole surpri the privacy issue is just blew up in the last 18 months because I don't think anybody appreciated just how big and serious that revolution in social networks was to our privacy of what we do online. My hope is that we've learned our lesson, and maybe that's a false hope, but we've learned our lesson, and when it comes to privacy on health data, we will think carefully about who owns that data. For example, the interesting thing is that it's not necessarily a company that owns that data, it's your data. So if it's your wearable, you can collect it at home and then you own it. So but my, it might exist in the cloud somewhere. Right. I mean, it's not like oh, absolutely. I mean, some company I sold nickel. you that wearable <laughs> and I, is sending software updates yeah. in this. I think, it's a, I think the problem is it's a huge problem, especially, you know, it took, I don't know how many decades to protect discrimination against gender, against age, against race. How many decades did that take? Now, if we know everything about your genetic makeup, your predispositions, like how you talk about it like it's done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many decades is that gonna take? Barry, I wanna ask you actually about this, this thesis that the business model will change because here you've been, you know, here you've taken this deep dive look at, at Vertex, which has this business model, which is pretty traditional. Um, and Katrina, I think, will hopefully talk to us about that when she comes back up, which is said, we develop this drug, it is for a specific purpose, we sell it for this really high cost, we sometimes subsidize, the cost of the drug. What do you think about this idea that there could be a change in incentives, that there could really, that the business model itself, all the way back to Enron, would start to evolve? There's been a productivity crisis in pharma for at least the last 30 years. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in the glory days when, when Merck was the miracle company and they were coming up with the first cures for hypertension and high cholesterol and asthma. Um, these, were, these were drugs that were consumed by hundreds of thousands, millions of people, and, and, and that model worked for big pharma. Last year, the FDA approved 59 new medicines. Um, only a third of those were from big pharma. 
two-thirds of them were actually from biotech companies, mostly in genetic diseases and in cancer. Big Pharma spent, the, the, the top 15 drug makers last year spent $100 billion on research. So you kind of, I mean, this, this is not even a calculation here. It's just a kind of a comparison. $100 billion, 20 new drugs. Drugs are incredibly expensive to develop and produce. Um, a lot of it is the clinical trials, and they're working on that. A lot of it is that, um, that, that the, the, the technologies that we've been talking about are just really starting to take root within the industry so that, so that there's a, a slightly greater certainty about going after a target and being able to develop a drug that will be effective with it. But I think what you're going to see is, um, at least with the first round of, of, of genetic diseases where there's one broken gene or one broken protein, and if you can come up with a molecule that, that corrects that, that problem, that smaller companies will be able to um, get in the game, as, as I think the evidence is from the rise in the number of approvals for biotech drugs. And that, um, and that the FDA also will respond as it has responded to the fact that you're not trying to approve this drug now for hundreds of thousands or millions of people. You're trying to uh, approve it for, say, in the case of cystic fibrosis, a total worldwide of 70,000 people. Um, I don't think it's going to change the, the, the cost equation, but I do think it's going to mean that, um, that the, the, the most focused, fleetest um, you know, companies are going to have an opportunity to, to really make a difference. So I think there's that possibility that, that, we're, that, that big pharma is just going to kind of be, turn and they've already turned largely into marketing companies. I think that's, that's only going to prove more so in the future. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's where things are heading. Safi, you look like you might have thoughts on that. Um, I mean, I think the segmentation into the big majors who can do big franchises and the small biotechs who can do crazy new drugs is, has been there in our industry for about 40 years since the IPO of Genentech in the early 80s. Um, and that's normal for an industry, and you need both. Just like the film industry, you have Columbia Universal Paramount making the next Avengers and Transformers, and you have the hundreds of small production shops doing the movies nobody thinks will work, like My Big Fat Greek Wedding, or, June, or investing in turtles that eat pizza and carry swords, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Nobody thought that would work. I mean, so you need both to survive, and it's important to have both because the risk is too high here. If you just had the crazy little companies with their crazy ideas, their loon shots, the industry would disappear. It's too much risk. But if you just had the franchises, the next statin drug, the next alter drug, they would disappear, the industry would disappear, would grow stale. So you need both coexisting with partnerships between them, and that's what you have in the film industry. That's what makes it sustainable. That's what you have in the drug discovery industry, and that's what makes it sustainable. So I think that will keep going. And I don't think that's the big issue. The big issue is how do we make drugs more affordable? How do we make clinical trials more affordable? And can we change the business model to incentivizing keeping you healthy rather than paying for when you're sick. So let's bring Yoop and Katrine up here. Um, and we're going to uh, turn to your questions. We've got a couple people with microphones sort of roaming around. Oh, we've already gotten one from Facebook. Um, OK. So, um, I have like a hundred more too. So don't I know me. I have a yeah. Um, so John from Facebook ads asks, what dictates the price of a new drug upon approval and entry to the marketplace, like I.e. three hundred thousand dollars for a cystic fibrosis drug? You want to start with that, Barry? But I'm interested. I mean, you've all worked with thinking about like how much should this drug be? Yeah, you know, to follow on that, I, your comment about marketing made me wonder: Is it all really R and D? Um, it depends. You know, so the drugs that you see advertised on the evening news, no, that's not all about R&D. That is a lot about marketing. But, um, but if you take something like cystic fibrosis, they're not going to advertise on television. There's no point in that. And the fact of the matter is that the commercialization of a drug that's targeted to people who have a genetic disease is a, is a minor 
cost relative to, you don't have to have a thousand people in your sales force, you don't have to advertise, there are very few doctors around that you actually have to convince to prescribe your drug. So it, that's, that, that cost comes down when you're talking about these, these new drugs for genetic diseases. I guess I feel like the real question, and maybe you've been, Katrine, you can jump in here, is that there's so much anger about drug prices, right? Because obviously, in the case of some of these new drugs, it, it genuinely is the cost of figuring out this genetic puzzle. In the case of a lot of the drugs that are on the market now, it's shareholder value. And so yeah. how, you know, how, how much of a problem is that perception going to be to this industry as it comes forward with drugs that might be legitimately that expensive? You know, it's, a, it's certainly a fundamental issue for the industry, but I think one of the, the fundamental challenges is um, how much of that cost do patients bear themselves. And this is, you know, it's, it's a part of our healthcare system that how drugs are paid for is completely different from how a lot of other things are paid for. And, and so patients often are bearing a very significant portion of that cost, um, even a much less expensive drug, and it hits them personally, and they're making choices. I mean, I remember one time going to the pharmacy to fill a prescription for my mother, and, you know, the reimbursement authorization hadn't gone through just yet because they were going to wait for 30 days, and so it was $500. Now, I was like, well, it's my mother's medication, I'm going to pay that, but many people, very understandably, would not be able to say, I'll just pay that and, and make sure my mother gets their medicine. Those are real choices, those are real issues, and how much of cost, whether it's you know, a lot or a little, the patient bears, that's often really where the issue is, is and I'm not trying to dismiss what the, the cost of the drug ultimately is, but I think if we focus on the patient and solving the problem for the patient and line up all the other interests, because it's you can talk about drug companies, you can talk about pairs, we can talk about all these different entities that are part of the mixture. Um, I think that there are a lot of competing incentives in there right now. And I think we need to just focus more on what's the patient bearing and make that low and affordable. And then it's it's not just about what the, the cost is, because oftentimes the cost that makes a headline nobody's paying that cost. It's, it's a very fictitious number and it, it makes great headlines, but the actual economics of who gets what amounts of money are a very, very, very different set of numbers. And it's, it's for anybody who's ever studied economics, it's one of the most irrational uh, systems I think you could possibly imagine um, and just lots of different pieces, lots of different entities fighting for different pieces of the pie, which is unfortunate. So let's go to a question out here. I think, is there one over here or not yet? Um, I don't know if we you got one right here in the second row. I have lots lots of comments, more than questions, but um, try to try to keep it to questions. Okay, I want to focus back on um, where we started, and that is our scientific understanding of the human genome and how that translates into um, better health care. We're still tremendously in the data collecting stage. And we have a long, long way to go. So the number of diseases that are just due to a single genetic mutation is the minority of what we all will experience in our lives. So, and I want to make the point that we're talking about, you know, cost of drugs and, and treating disease where we really still, some of this genetic data will really, really help us with prevention which is the cheapest way to care for people, preventing the disease so you don't need the $300,000 drug. So, um, and I think we also live in, I'm bringing in about 100 ideas, but I also think we live in particularly right. our culture yeah. where we want a quick fix. And um, there, in terms of prevention, you know, some of it, it's the interaction between genetics and lifestyle, et cetera. So I'll, just a quick um, example, I'm a physician, I saw a patient today, uterine cancer. She said, I'm doing everything right, I'm cured, I'm on a keto diet, I lost 20 pounds. And it came up in conversation that she was still smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. So there were just the point that there are a lot of interactions with genetics and it's not just as simple as a single gene that we're gonna turn on or off. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've been, yeah. Katrine, that's what you were saying, right? Is that it's... Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a small number... And the data, the need for data, it seems like, to your point, too, only yeah, increases. I would say two things. One, one is like 
100% agree on prevention, and I hope everybody here is vaccinated and all your kids are vaccinated. Can I please just beg you to get vaccinated? Um, but, uh, but I think, too, with regard to um, you know, the, the question about, yes, these rare genetic diseases, they are rare individually. Collectively, they're common. I mean, I'm willing to bet that half or more of the people in this room know somebody with a genetic disease. But more than that, I think, as you think about developing drugs, working in these rare genetic diseases or specific cancers, where it's essentially sort of the, I'll say the cleanest scientific situation of we know this mutation causes this disease, it's more clear, it's black and white, it's not probabilities. We figure out how to use the technology. And that then creates a foundation where we can then take a next step for these more complex situations. And, and I think that that, you know, even within the world of genetic diseases, the disease we start with, with gene editing, there's tons of those successful genetic diseases that are still too complicated. And those are ones where it's a single gene. So part of translating science from really exciting laboratory work, which is profoundly powerful and, you know, papers and Nobel Prizes come out of them, Going from that to a medicine is a very, very long journey, but these translational steps, if you can take them in ways where the first thing you work on has a ton of leverage to many more, that you can do that intentionally, right? Where the first thing you work on, okay, we know how to deliver this gene editing medicine to the eye, but the way we delivered it, we can create a slight variant and we get to a lot of other tissues. So you figure out all the hard stuff on this one, but then delivery is translatable specificity is translatable. How do you manufacture the molecule? So you learn a lot in the wake of this first program that hopefully then, you know, just as a wake broadens from, from a boat, hopefully the wake will broaden to a much wider range of diseases. It, certainly, my, and I am an optimist because I work in biotech and you have to be an optimist, uh, but I do, I do think that's real. And I've seen that in my career with other technologies, with antibodies as drugs. I remember when they were like the hardest thing in the world to do, and now it's a commodity. It's a fabulous commodity. Other, do other questions out in the audience? Looks like there's one on that side. Yeah, I have perhaps four or five comments, but they all come under one title. My background is I spent the 20th century developing electronic engineering and communications, which is what you're into now in the 21st century is biotechnology. And I think that's going to go the same way communication went in the 20th century. But the things I've written down here are all yeah, questions yeah. of all right. profit, so you guys profit. know I'm the mean one about the questions. So I see you with your notes, and I got my eye on you. No, no, I'll sum it up. I know you want a quick answer. It's all driven by word, one word, profits. And the first one is, how do you... How do you pay for your medication? For universal coverage or private firms? Costs in the US for medicine versus international costs. Uh, I'm one of the person who takes one of those expensive medicines called Enbro. And yet after 20 years on the market, even with patents, they still find a way to keep that patent alive. And there's now probably 20 products of those out right now. And yet the prices go up 20% every year. Uh, Morality versus regulation. This all comes down to morality in the final end and profit. And what are we going to do about regulation? Will that ever happen? So and finally... I, so I think we can take it from there because I think you posed a really good question about cost. Um, and I hear people like seconding that. And even though we've talked about it, this question, you know, so some of it is rare drugs. Um, MIT Tech Review had this great cover uh, maybe six months ago, we're just a baby on the cover, and it was like, this, it'll cost $2 million to like fix what she has. Would you pay it, and could you? Um, and I think, and, and indeed, there are millionaires who have really helped kid, their children who have rare diseases. So I think this issue of cost, again, I'll bring it back to you. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about it, but do we have a system that's set up for both sort of the astronomical price of, you know, the kind of drugs we've been living with, but then even these even more costly drugs where drug companies have, if they're going to cure cystic fibrosis, they're going to need to get the money from you at the beginning because you're going to be fine in 20 years. So I'll, this may surprise you coming from an investor, but for me that's a very clear no, we don't. 
Um, my views may be influenced by the fact that I live in Europe for a long time and I've seen what happens. I've seen what happens when innovators and payers don't agree. And boy, can I get ugly. Vertex has put some amazing medicines and cystic fibrosis in the industry and available to patients. But when they didn't agree with France on pricing, they stopped the phase three trials. I.e., if you're a cystic fibrosis patient in France, you were screwed. Is that still true? No, I think it's mm. been fixed. But okay. in my opinion, it's hard to single out and say these are the culprits, particularly I mean, imagine I came to the US three years ago. Somebody showed me a picture of the payer system in the US. I mean, I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> right? So let's also not forget that a lot of the, you know, there's the price, and then there's whoever ends up with the money. And there's a lot of in-betweens who end up with a lot of money. At least that would be my simple assessment based on the US payer system. But it's clear in my mind that particularly as we get stratification in patient populations like we discussed earlier, we get more precise medicine. There should be no biotech company who's afraid of that. If you have an innovative medicine that really makes an impact for patients, I am an optimist, like I think everybody here on the panel, people are willing to pay for that. Now what are they willing to pay? What is a fair price? What is a sustainable price in the future? I feel as an investor, and again, that's why I started off by saying that it may surprise you coming from an investor, but it's pretty clear in my mind that we need some new models here because 10, 20 years down the road, and maybe even earlier, this none of this is sustainable. I'm not saying, again, I come back to the point that I feel people will be willing to pay for impactful drugs. But I also feel there's a lot of things out there where people just take advantage of the fact that you can charge whatever the heck you want. And I don't think long term that is sustainable. Is that how we get to regulation? Do you think? Well, I, I don't want to depress everybody too much. <laughs> but uh, I, I would like it. to a show of hands. How many people have investment portfolios? Stocks. How many people own stocks? How many people own drug stocks? Have drug stocks in those? investment portfolio. So maybe half of the people who have portfolios have drug stocks. I mean, we, you know, uh, the way our system works is we, we, we want these companies to be profitable. We want these companies to make money and return that money to their shareholders. It takes 20 plus years in many cases to go from the basic discovery until there's actually a drug on the market. And then there's the I'm not defending this. I'm just saying this is how it is. And then there's this short window of a number of years before the patent runs out and, and the drug becomes a generic. So we all, we're all involved in this. It's not them. And, and, and I also think we need to make a distinction between companies that are developing transformational revolutionary drugs and the Martin Screllys of the world and not even, you know, and the, and, the, and the big pharma companies that are doing everything they can, as you say, sir, to extend the patent life and squeeze whatever profits they can out of expiring product lines, you know, but that's, that's where we are. We're in the United States of America in 2019. That's how we operate. So unless we're willing to hit that head on, I don't know that things are going to change. Well, and I, I do think that's what may, I think we should stipulate that cost is the question, right? Like that is the question that almost everybody with a hand up is gonna ask in some form. Because, maybe not, <laughs> but it hits everybody so hard. And, and is that where the loon shots come in, in terms of like really, truly trying to reinvent this business model? Because to be honest, like the investors I know, they're not trying to, they're not trying to reinvent the model. They're in it because it's a gold rush. And so. No, it's for two, if you do something for 200 years, you pay people for products to treat sick people. If you keep paying people for products to treat sick people, you're going to keep doing the same thing. It's not a surprise that the people who are selling those products want to get the best return. And it's not even, you know, I understand it as someone who has to pay as well for medicine and copay. If you had, if your mother or relative had cancer and you had a team working on developing a drug to treat what she had. Wouldn't you want to motivate the members of your team by any means necessary? Now, some members of those teams are certainly going to be altruistic. They're going to want to just do everything they can. 
Others have mortgages. Whatever it takes. If I have a relative with cancer and there's a team of 20 people, I want every toolkit, every tool that I can use to motivate those people to work hard. And if one of them is, well, we live in a capitalist society, we need to pay those people equally. The question is, why aren't we paying them more? For example, college kids, rather than want to come build the next online app, if we could actually incentivize them even more in medical research and biotech and STEM and creating new drugs, I would argue we actually want to figure out our incentive system so that we can excite college kids, even high school kids, to work on new ideas, on loon shots, on crazy ideas. We want to create more incentives to improve health, not less. Price regulation makes it less. We are motivating, you know, we're creating, you know, 100 billionaires for selling stuff online or, you know, poking people online or whatever, <laughs> whatever they do. I would rather do that in the, the, uh, in the medical research industry because that's more important for society than having the next gaming app or something. Let's take a question over it. here. I wasn't trying to stop your questions. I think we have one, and then we've had this one in the front for a minute. Um, so I guess this is a question about cost, but I'm getting at it a different way, and it kind of touches on uh, points that everybody's, all your panelists have raised. Um, so we all agree that the system is incredibly irrationally designed, at least here in the U.S. I don't think anybody's arguing with that. But I guess my question is, are the stakeholders now, given how much money is involved in the industry across every um, spectrum of who's involved in it, are the stakeholders so embedded? Are, are we? Is there a way to incrementally get to where we need to get, or does there just need to be one massive crisis that finally kind of brings, for lack of a better word, a strong man to the table who just kind of blows up the current business models and refashions it? Because it just reminds, you know, Upton Sinclair's statement, it's very hard for a man to understand a problem particularly when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And so when you look at all the players involved, it just seems like it's almost intractable from that standpoint. I mean, I wonder, you know, you talked about Europe and, and you've got a lot of boards like NICE in the UK that's like, well, we're willing to pay for this and no, this extends your life three months and it's $50,000. No, sorry, we're not going to pay for it. And they make those kinds of really hard decisions. Um, is there a country, like, is there a model out there that you're like, they got it right and we should totally do that? I don't think there's like one model that does that and sometimes I've been flabbergasted by some of the decisions that NICE makes, don't get me wrong. I think particularly for highly innovative drugs that are impactful, that have a huge clinical benefit and still somehow, I don't want to single out NICE, but some of the HDAs come out on the wrong side of that, don't ask me why that is. I do see some elements that I like a lot. Again, if you have an innovative, impactful drug, these schemes where you pay for performance, why would you be afraid of that? I think that's a very nice one, actually. If you're willing to make your commercial success dependent on how well a drug works and the patients that take it, why is that bad? Yeah, that's to me, that's to me, a lot of those models, there's a lot of those yeah, already going on, and there's some been. very innovative yeah. payers. We have one here with Harvard Pilgrim, who's been on the forefront of that, right? They have struck some of these, of these deals okay, where... Explain how that would work. If you were taking a drug for... Explain like it... Uh, well, take, take for example, for. Uh, there's a lot of debate now about uh, gene therapy, let's say, in something like hemophilia, right? We don't have them yet, but hemophilia A, B, the idea is you get blood factors, and then there's a subcutaneous product from uh, Roche. But the gene therapy, the idea is you get it, and you're pretty much you know for a long time you're covered now how can you measure if that still works well that's actually not so hard you measure the blood factor in your blood and so as long as you get it above a certain level you keep paying so you make it dependent on a successful outcome this is just one example but there are many there's some disease where what I just said is very hard and there's a lot of ifs and buts because if you're an insurer you worry about you worry about the patient churn you have to pay everything up front so if you spread it out a little bit over time and you keep on paying upon you know something working I think there are settings in which that can work it's not a cure for all but it may work I come back to the point and I agree with with the other panelists I think 
Um, we are in an industry which is known to be highly innovative, right? And we haven't seen the beginning yet. There's so much coming through that I think will be very impactful. I like your uh, thought also about maybe not paying for curing disease, but 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 you know, for for uh, stimulating wellness and health. Um, but all of that means that what's to come is a deluge. There's a lot to come. So you cannot get stuck in the same way as we think today. And that has been shaped by some of these drugs that were thrown on massive populations. And, and, and you know, we're stratifying. We're becoming more precise. Don't be afraid of new models for paying. And I think, you know, paying for performance for some disease could be wonderful. Interesting. I feel like we could go about 40 I more know, minutes could, and we're out of time. Thank you so much for... Your questions, I'm sorry, I see the unanswered ones I in the so audience. Many, so many. Um, a round of applause for our fantastic panelists. <laughs> and for Molly Wood, who flew all the way out from the Bay Area. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank we you. appreciate it. We'll be around a few more minutes if you have last questions.